Hi, welcome to Bookie. To unlock more world-class bestseller, please download our app. Just search for B-O-O-K-E-Y at Apple Store or Google Play. You will get 7 days free trail with more features. Today we will unlock the book The Chrysanthemum and the Sword. When we hear Japan mentioned, we perhaps think of cars, animation, electronics, sakura blossoms, shrines, and Japanese service. Indeed, Japanese products and services can be found across the world. They are accepted and used globally and are generally praised for their high quality. After World War II, in order to satisfy Japan's need for economic development, Japan started to export their products to many countries around the world. Japan also encouraged Japanese enterprises to step out of Japan and take part in international acquisitions. For example, in 2018, Takeda Pharmaceutical Company acquired Ireland's Shire Pharmaceutical Company for 7 trillion Japanese yen. Japan's SoftBank Corporation acquired 51 projects worldwide at a total cost of 9 trillion Japanese yen. According to statistics, in 2018, Japanese corporations made 32 overseas acquisitions worth over 10 trillion yen. This was an increase of 70% compared to the previous year. The number and cost of global acquisitions reached a historical high. Japan's expansion will not stop, and it is very likely that some of our future colleagues, partners, neighbors, or new friends will be Japanese. Thus, learning more about the culture, characteristics, and values of Japanese people is practical and meaningful for our international exchanges and cooperation. Historians tell us that all behavioral patterns are based on cultural backgrounds. Therefore, we should begin by learning about the origin of Japanese culture to understand the behavioral patterns of Japanese people. This book The Chrysanthemum and the Sword is a classic, that analyzes the origins of Japanese culture and studies the character of Japanese people. The author of this book Ruth Benedict is an American cultural anthropologist who specializes in cultural anthropology, and is involved in long-term studies on different national cultures. She wrote The Chrysanthemum and the Sword in a later period of World War II. At that time, Germany was already destined to lose the war, and the United States was in desperate need of a post-war policy for Japan. However, due to the culture differences between the Western and Eastern societies, and the lack of a deep understanding of Japanese culture, the U.S. remained undecided on its policy towards the country, would the Japanese government surrender or not? And if Japan surrendered, should the American government utilize the Japanese government and keep the emperor? In order to make the right call, the American government decided to encourage experts of various fields to study Japan, resulting in the publication of the Chrysanthemum and the Sword. It became known as a groundbreaking work of modern Japanology and spread widely, enduring over a long period of time. Next, we will discuss Japanese culture together by answering four questions. Question 1. How should we understand Japan's strict hierarchical concept of taking one's proper station? Question 2. How can we understand Japanese culture's attachment to Gimu and Giri? Question 3. What is the contradiction in Japanese people's attitude towards sensory pleasure? Question 4. What moral dilemmas exist in Japanese culture? If somebody desires to get to know Japanese people, he or she must first understand their dependence on hierarchy. We can compare the importance of Japanese people's dependence on hierarchy to American people's belief in liberty and equality. Japanese people's belief in hierarchy not only determines their relationship with political power and how they relate to one another, but also influences how they handle international relations. So, how do we understand hierarchy in Japan? The answer can essentially be summarized in four words, taking one's proper station. This means that people of each class need to act in accordance with the orders of that class. It can be seen in family and social interactions when family members adopt different behavioral norms according to their generation, age and sexuality. From the perspective of social interaction, children must observe and learn etiquette, and cultivate a sense of hierarchy from an early age. Those of you who have been to Japan may have experienced the complexity of Japanese etiquette. In social interactions, 
the rules of etiquette differ based on the identity and social status of the person one is faced with. There are specific rules and requirements for using language and gestures. Let us take Japan's most common greeting, bowing as an example. One not only needs to know who they should bow to, but also the angle and duration of their bowing. Acquaintances need to bow for 2 to 3 seconds, and the duration is even longer for intimate friends. When one runs into someone of higher social status or one's elder, one can only lift his or her head up after the other party has done so. Sometimes it is even necessary to bow several times. It is also necessary to use respectful language when interacting with elders or people of a higher social status. This respectful language requires people to address and treat someone differently on different occasions. For example, the word do has many different versions for different occasions. Now let us look at the familial perspective. Hierarchy based on generation, gender, and birth order forms the core of family life. There is a set order for the young and old, and a different set of rules for men and women. Each individual has a specific place in their family. The younger generation must obey their elders, the family property is inherited by the eldest son, women's status is lower than men's, and a wife must obey her husband. Unlike in China, Japan's filial piety is limited to close family members, which includes fathers, grandfathers, uncles, granduncles, and their offspring. They enshrine spirit tablets which are similar to tombstones for their ancestors. If the words on the great grandfather's spirit tablet can no longer be read, they will not be re engraved. The graveyards of ancestors who lived three generations ago are soon forgotten. The father or eldest brother is responsible for all family members and the reputation of the family. When significant issues are met, family meetings are held to discuss and make decisions on the issue. From a political perspective, social classes back in feudal society were clearly divided and hereditary. Take the Tokugawa shoguns for example. The Tokugawas required that each household post a symbol identifying their social status and heredity on their door. Their clothing, food, and house should all comply with the rules of their inherited identity. There were four classifications for hereditary identities under the imperial family and in the court nobles. Warriors, farmers, artisans, and merchants, in order of high social status to low social status. This formed a strict hierarchy. Beneath them were people considered outcasts, they participated in filthy and basic jobs, such as grave digging and stripping animal skins. They were called untouchables, and were not even seen as human. The outcasts were under heavy pressure and controlled by strict laws. Cruel punishments were inevitable if they broke rules or dared to revolt. The Japanese concept of hierarchy extended into World War II. The belief driving their war efforts was the desire to establish hierarchy. The goal was to establish every country's position in an international hierarchy, with Japan ruling at the top. This was apparent in Japan, Italy, and Germany's tripartite pact, in whose foreword Japan wrote. The governments of Japan, Germany, and Italy consider it as a condition precedent to any lasting peace that all nations of the world be each given its proper station. The statement that the Japanese ambassador handed to the United States Secretary of State on the day of the attack on Pearl Harbor also mentioned it is the immutable policy of the Japanese government to enable each nation to find its proper place in the world. The Japanese government cannot tolerate the continuation of the present situation. Since it runs directly counter to Japan's fundamental policy to enable each nation to enjoy its proper station in the world. The so called proper station in the world meant to establish a hierarchical position and status for each country. When seeing this evidence, it is apparent that the risks Japan took during World War II were guided by this mindset. What's more, Japan even said taking one's proper station as its basic national policy at the time. In Japan's hierarchy, the emperor is no doubt at the top. A lot of Americans think that through history, the emperor has never had any real power, it was the shogunate that was really powerful, and that the emperor simply represented an outdated and ignorant feudal concept. Benedict, however, points out that this is an American misunderstanding of the Japanese emperor. She emphasized that Japanese people's adoration for the emperor was entirely different from Germans' adoration of Hitler. 
Hitler was just an ordinary guy to the Germans. He did not represent the spirit of Germany, because he was only an elected official. For Japanese people, the emperor was an essential part of Japan, he was the symbol of Japan, and without him, Japan would cease to exist. The emperor had become a mere public figure, and lived in his palace stripped of political power since around 1192, the Kamakura period. Despite this, Japanese people's respect for and faith in him never ceased, and he was always enthusiastically celebrated. Before World War II, Japanese people even believed that the emperor was no ordinary human being, but the offspring of gods. Their attitude towards the emperor reflected the stability and authority of the Japanese hierarchy. Japan fits better in an orderly world than any other sovereign state. The Japanese people have learned to equate hierarchy with safety and stability. According to this belief, as long as they stay within the predetermined boundaries and fulfill their duties, the world will remain stable, and nothing will go wrong. That concludes the first part of this bookie. The strict concept of taking one's proper station is an important aspect of Japanese culture. The hierarchy of Japanese society is reflected in the different perspectives of their familial and social life, and influences their handling of international relations. The Japanese emperor is at the top of the hierarchy in Japan, and Japanese people regard him as being above all else. Understanding hierarchy in Japan is the first step to understanding Japanese people's values and Japan's national psychology. Today we are just sharing limited bookie. To unlock more key insights of world-class bestseller, please download our app. Just search for B-O-O-K-E-Y at Apple Store or Google Play. You will get 7 days free trail with more features.